Hi friends, today let's talk about uh, the advanced life support or the ALS. Uh, now, this is a very important topic for the exam purposes also because um, as we know each year uh, one or two questions are frequently asked in the FRCS exams. Um, and along with that, uh, other than the exam purposes, this, exam, this topic is uh, very important for all the practicing doctors and nurses because uh, um, as we know, um, if we have a uh, uh, basic knowledge about the BLS uh, basic life support and the advanced life support, then we can prevent uh, um, uh, cardiac deaths or the cardiopulmonary arrest in the hospital or even on the ho outside the hospital. So let's start. Now, um, uh, this is a uh, this is a four uh, four rings we can see uh, we can see over here or the links four links. Uh, which is known as the chain of survival. Now, basically, uh, each link over here is very important and uh, is interconnected. So, um, uh, one must follow uh, each link uh, over here. So, the first ring over here, as we can say, uh, we can see um, if we suppose we uh, see an unconscious patient, unconscious person, even if outside the hospital, what we are supposed to do is uh, we must immediately call for uh, help. Yeah, we must recognize it, uh, whether it is a, a, a cardiopulmonary arrest, CPA, or uh, then if it is indeed, then we need to call um, uh, call for help. Yeah, uh, then uh, as soon as we, um, we have called for the help, uh, we will start to uh, CPR that is cardiopulmonary res resuscitation yeah till now it's all uh, all of the part is uh, about the BLS yeah basic life support then after restarting the cardiopulmonary resuscitation as we can see by um, giving compression to the chest um, and then um, or once we have the AED suppose we are outside the hospital and uh, we have uh, just the external defibrillator, yeah, automated external defibrillator, AED. So in that case, what we'll do uh, is uh, AED itself um, uh, will recognize if it's a if it is a shockable rhythm or, or if it's not a shockable rhythm. So in that case, if it is a shockable rhythm, um, uh, as as part of the uh, BLS protocol, uh, we can't do much, and that AED um, machine uh, that will give a shock to the patient only if it is a shockable rhythm and if it is not a shockable rhythm then we will continue uh, and give the compression to the chest and uh, we will talk about uh, all of this stuff in the coming slides then uh, uh, here we can see the fourth link or the four, fourth ring is the post resuscitation care that is the return of, of return of uh, spontaneous circulation and of course um, here would be, uh, of course, the help would have definitely arrived till now. So that's why we are talking about the post-resuscitation care here. So uh, these, uh, uh, this is for uh, someone who is not even a doctor or someone who is not even a medical staff. Uh, a lame person uh, who doesn't have any knowledge about uh, medicine uh, must be familiar with this thing because this is very important and this is the chain of survival. Now, uh, that was mostly uh, outside the hospital, chain of survival. Now let's talk about uh, doctors and the nurses, medical staff, what they can do to prevent the uh, uh, current uh, sudden uh, cardiac death or uh, uh, cardiopulmonary arrest, what we can do uh, as the doctors. So, uh, chain of prevention, yeah, that was chain of survival. This one is chain of prevention. Now, chain of prevention is very important. Um, now, here we can see we have five rings uh, illustrating education, monitoring, recognition, call for help, and response. Now, why is it important? Because uh, uh, all the doctors, all the medical staff, uh, they must be uh, well educated about uh, how can we prevent uh, sudden cardiac death because uh, simply by educating them, and uh, after once they are educated about the ABC approaches, like airways, breathing, circulation, what they can do is they must know how to monitor uh, each and every patient who is in the hospital. Uh, monitoring uh, by 
simple means with your pulse oximetry or with your uh, cardiac monitor uh, simply you can easily uh, monitor these patients now just by monitoring them uh, isn't that's not sufficient we must be able to recognize few uh, vital parameters vital signs uh, um, and uh, how can we recognize suppose the patient has a uh, very high high heart rate increased heart rate somewhere around 150 so uh, what uh, as a medical staff <clears throat> we must know that uh, 150 heart rate is something not normal so this is how we recognize or suppose someone's saturation um, is around uh, 75 so let's say uh, then we must know something is not okay with this patient the person the person can deteriorate the person is the person is ill suppose the bp uh, blood pressure is by is uh, uh, 90 to 70 so of course uh, we can easily recognize and uh, we can imagine the person is deteriorating or the person will deteriorate or the person is ill yeah so uh, or the temperature is very low or the temperature is very high or the heart rate or the uh, respiratory rate uh, the patient the person is uh, tachypnic yeah or the person is tachycardic or um, bradycardic or you know uh, these kind of vital signs which are general uh, uh, really helps you know if we can uh, we can be uh, much more alert in the hospital so that we can uh, easily recognize these uh, vital signs vital parameters uh, because if we see such situations where something is not okay with the patient simply by looking at these uh, vital parameters yeah as i said heart rate respiratory rate temperature oxygen saturation yeah such kind of these kind of things you know we recognize them and then our immediate role even if we uh, we are not practicing as a uh, emergency doctors uh, we must be able to uh, we must be able to call for help yeah then we call for help this is our uh, this is our role then doctors who really uh, are concerned now basically uh, emergency doctors or the icu specialist icu doctors uh, basically uh, they will come and they will uh, uh, they will reach and they will uh, response and even if they don't come they uh, uh, it takes some time you know even if it takes few minutes by the time they reach uh, it is our role to respond how can we respond suppose as as i uh, already said suppose let's take an example someone has a blood pressure of uh, um, 95 by uh, 65 let's say 95 to uh, 95 uh, on 65 so 95 on 65 uh, is a low bp yeah so low bp what what how can we respond we can respond simply by giving the patient some crystalloid fluids yeah simple one is your uh, nacl 0.9 percent yeah so uh, we can give uh, uh, saline fluid yeah all the crystallites what we can do simple a simple response what what we could take so simply this this thing happens this thing really helps and uh, they can easily prevent uh, deaths uh, in the hospital yeah simply by if we recognize them and uh, um, effectively respond so now lo let's go to the next slide now we, we talked about chain of survival we, cha we talked about chain of prevention now how can we know uh, now let's talk about some simple causes what can happen to a patient what can happen to a person in the hospital and the causes of uh, cardiorespiratory arrest so after talking about these two slides chain of survival and chain of prevention let's see what we can do how do we recognize what can happen to a patient what generally happens to a patient and what can be done now area obstruction each one of these abcs have some causes have some how to recognize how to recognize them and how to treat them and each one each one of them uh, uh, will work uh, through the apcd approach yeah so now airway obstruction now as we know causes of the airway obstruction can be now airway obstruction causes can be upper way upper way upper airway obstruction lower upper uh, lower airway obstructions uh simply uh, just like um, suppose uh, somebody's uh, uh, central nervous system depression yeah so by taking opioids uh, drug toxicity or uh, the patient uh, the patient has uh, some uh, 
um, brain tumor or intracerebral, intracerebral hemorrhage, something, anything which is causing uh, increased ICP in the brain, of course, then uh, the level of consciousness of that patient would be decreased. And once the level of consciousness of that patient is decreased, that will ultimately call uh, uh, that will uh, that will cause your uh, airway obstruction, yeah, because the patient won't be able to uh, protect uh, his airway reflexes, yeah. So the tongue will fall backwards, and ultimately it will call it it would cause uh, airway obstruction. So CNS depression can be one cause. Then there can be foreign body in the mouth, yeah, uh, like any object, yeah or uh, suppose uh, uh, vomitus is inside or bleeding suppose the patient has a, had a trauma or uh, uh, suppose uh, he had uh, uh, hemoptysis so in that case blood is uh, over there in the mouth and accumulated so that is causing uh, your uh, airway obstruction or it can be a laryngitis suppose it uh, upper wear, upper airway obstruction all these are the causes you know um, of the airway obstructions so these are the causes then how do we recognize now airway obstruction it can be simply a partial one or it can be a complete one now complete uh, suppose someone is with a complete uh, airway obstruction uh, how do we recognize as a doctors we recognize it by simply complete airway obstruction uh, we try to listen for the breath sounds near uh, the person's mouth uh, since it is a complete airway obstruction, we won't be able to hear any uh, noise. Why so? Because uh, uh, there there won't be any flow of the air in the any uh, from mouth to lungs. Yeah. So since there is no air flow, of course, then that's why uh, uh, why is, uh, that's why the noise it would be silent. Yeah. We won't be able to hear anything. So this is how we recognize, and uh, uh, the person won't be able to talk anything. Yeah. Person won't be able to speak. And uh, so then we can imagine that, that the person, of course, has some uh, complete airway obstruction going on. Whereas if the, uh, where if, uh, where if, uh, whereas if the obstruction is partial one, then uh, uh, when we try to uh, listen for the breath sounds, uh, it would be noisy. Yeah, it would be noisy and a uh, person might be able to speak a few words. Yeah, so it would be noisy and uh, that one is the partial obstruction so this is how we recognize ultimately the partial uh, airway obstruction that will lead to complete airway obstruction so uh, we need to take immediate action now talking about uh, we talked about few causes how to recognize them and then how to treat them now treating these causes would be uh, suppose uh, there's a person who is choking yeah person who is choking it is of course it's a, it can be it is kind of a partial obstruction so in that case uh, what we can do is we can if it is mild or if, whether it is severe if it is mild uh, what we can do is we can let the patient uh, that person uh, uh, cuff that uh, material uh, whatever he has in his mouth you know that is obstructing his airway so let the patient cuff because it can relieve that obstruction yeah and if uh, suppose uh, that obstruction is not relieved, uh, suppose the person the person keeps on choking, then we can do some abdominal. Uh, we can give some abdominal thrust. Yeah, um, Heimlich maneuver, Heimlich maneuver, or the abdominal thrust that uh, that what we can uh, give to the patient, um, so that that uh, obstruction can be relieved. Uh, or uh, simply, if suppose we see uh, the person has um, blood vomitus in the mouth, what we can do is uh, we can uh, aspirate that, or um, we can uh, we can use uh, medial spores, forceps. We can remove any coin or any nut or something in the mouth. Do you know? Um, therefore, relieving that obstruction, and uh, or simply if um, we don't see by opening the mouth we don't see any obstruction we don't see any object foreign material in the mouth what we can do is we can uh, uh, simply uh, do head tilt chin lift maneuvers here yeah? and uh, so and if the we are suspecting any um, um, uh, cervical uh, instability or cervical trauma then in that case we can do the jaw thrust maneuver we will talk about each of each one of them so these were the causes recognition and how to treat them yeah and um, now, uh, suppose the patient, uh, the per person is uh, 
we can uh, person is unconscious also we can make the person lie uh, in the recovery poses, uh, position that is uh, lateral yeah laterally we can place the patient so these are a few things let's talk about the next one this was air obstruction let's talk about the breathing problems now so yes yeah, so again um yeah sorry so this was the air obstruction then for the breathing problems now breathing problems what it can be breathing problems causes can be same as what were uh, the problems uh, the causes which were for the airway obstruction simply just by uh, thinking about uh, anything that causes your central nervous system depression that, that uh, depresses our uh, um, conscious level yeah uh, so same causes just like any pathology in the brain uh, any intracerebral hemorrhage brain tumor or uh, any drug toxicity yeah uh, anything that causes your uh, uh, icp uh, uh, decrease level of consciousness yeah uh, or sedates you yeah any sedative drugs and whatever so these are the things which will cause your uh, breathing problems as well yeah also breathing problem causes can be uh, suppose any pathology in the lung yeah suppose the patient has the copd yeah or any mm, lung pneumonia so what what these are ultimately causing uh, these are uh, 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 leading to poor uh, gas exchange in the in your uh, lungs so therefore causing uh, ultimately breathing problems so one must be able to uh, these are the causes yeah then it can be tension pneumothorax which is the most severe one it can be which is uh, compressing on all on your heart on your lungs and all your circulation because uh, uh, tension pneumothorax what it will do is uh, it won't be able it won't let your uh, venous circulation coming back to your heart and uh, ultimately your co uh, your cardiac output will decrease and you, you will lose your consciousness ultimately it can be so uh, these are the few causes then it can be uh, these are the causes yeah basic ones and uh, then it of course it can be uh, your uh, uh, myasthenia gravis or uh, julien barre syndromes because uh, uh, these can um, create problems in your diaphragm uh, uh, because as we know uh, c3 c4 c5 uh, keeps you alive yeah so simple mnemonic for c3 c4 c5 is the one so that keeps you alive because these are the c3 c4 c5 spinal cord levels are the one which uh, innervate your uh, diaphragm so any lesion any cervical lesion any spinal cord injury any trauma uh, that can injure your c3 c4 c5 or upper levels that can create problems and ultimately your diaphragm won't be innovated and you won't be able to respirate uh, uh, the way you are supposed to be so these are the few causes for the breathing problems too then how do we recognize them of course we recognize them um, how that the person has the breathing problems uh, a conscious person uh, uh, will complain uh, uh, will complain that uh, his uh, his uh, his uh, having a shortness of breath he's irritable he would be irritable and uh, he would be anxious agitated so these this is how you can recognize that something is not going uh, okay with the person basically the person will say uh, um, like uh, he is having dyspnea yeah he is having shortness of breath so of course if it's he or she is having so shortness of breath sob then of course you can imagine that uh, there's some pathology some uh, something something is going on with this person so it can be easily uh, recognized now cyanosis is uh, the uh, breathing problems can lead to cyanosis also but it is a late sign so this is how basically you can recognize the breathing problems then how to treat them now treating breathing problems can be uh, by treating simply the first measure can be taken uh, is uh, giving the person oxygen some oxygen yeah until and unless the person is hypercapnic uh, he has hypercapnic uh, the one who is uh, uh, restoring too much co2 uh, such as in the copd patients so in that case our saturation uh, goal would be somewhere around 92% but if the person is normal and uh, he's not uh, a COPD patient, uh, so in that case, uh, uh, in a normal person, we can aim for 95, 96 CO2, uh, sorry, um, SpO2, your saturation of, of oxygen. So that would be our goal. And how do we treat it? By simply giving uh, 15 liter of uh, 15 liter per minute of oxygen. 
through a mask and a reservoir. So this is how we can treat uh, simply by giving oxygen. Other than that, suppose the patient is with the tension pneumothorax. In tension pneumothorax, suppose, <clears throat> sorry, you can't, we, uh, suppose a, a person has a, a person uh, just had a, a RTA, that is road traffic, road traffic accident. Uh, he met a road traffic accident and you try to auscultate on the lung fields of the patient. And suppose uh, on the right side or the left side or the bilaterally, suppose you don't, uh, you can't hear any breath sounds. So ultimately, um, then you can, uh, very quickly, you can think about uh, uh, the person might be suffering from tension pneumothorax. So in that case, how do we treat? We, uh, um, the first and basic uh, uh, thing would be to uh, get a 14 gauge needle and to insert it in the second intercostal space on the ipsilateral side. Suppose the patient, uh, suppose uh, you couldn't hear uh, breath sound on the right side. So in the right side, in the second intercostal space, uh, in the midclavicular line, yeah, in the midclavicular line, in the anterior thorax, uh, you would insert that 14 gauge needle, and uh, that will, uh, for some ex for some extent, it would uh, uh, decompress your uh, that uh, tension pneumothorax. So then later on, what we can, what you can do is you can uh, this was uh, this was needle thoracal synthesis. Then later on, you can uh, put a chest drain to evacuate that tension pneumothorax. <clears throat> so these were the causes recognition and this is how you treat uh, for the breathing problems. Then let's talk about the circulation problems. Now in the circulation problem, what could be the causes? Now the causes could be uh, plenty. Like suppose the uh, person has acute coronary syndrome. Person might be having ventricular fibrillation or uh, a person has uh, um, any cardiomyopathy, myopathies, suppose basically the, the main one are your hypertrophic, yeah, obstructed one. So, or um, stenosis, yeah, any any heart problem, any heart problem uh, could be the cause that could create circulation problems, yeah. So, or if it, or there is an external hemorrhage, yeah, the person is in a shock, a shock state, yeah. Suppose the person has cardiogenic shock. So it's like in cardiogenic shock, uh, uh, or the person is in hypovolemic, no, hypovolemic shock. In high, uh, suppose the person is in sepsis or anaphylactic shock. Now in sepsis and anaphylactic shock, it, there would be a vasodilate, no, vasodilation. So in vasodilation, of course, your uh, uh, peripheral vascular resistance, it will be decreased. So of course, your systolic blood pressure would be decreased. So that can be easily recognized that the person has uh, a shock. The person is in a shock state, yeah. Uh, but do remember that uh, uh, shock, uh, blood pressure can be normal in shock also, yeah. So causes I already talked about, yeah. Causes can be plenty. Uh, it could be uh, any any problem related to the uh, that is causing circulation problems. For an example, even pneumothorax, pneumothorax or the cardiac tamponade. Uh, how come they are uh, they are the causes of circulation problem because I talked about them in the breathing problem also. Uh, so now tension pneumothorax, what it uh, what or the cardiac tamponade, what they really do is, since the intrathoracic pressure uh, uh, starts to build up, it increases. Uh, as we know for the breathing, we know uh, we need uh, negative intrathoracic pressure. Yeah, negative so that uh, blood can be sucked from the veins. Yeah, uh, our uh, <clears throat> lower limb veins uh, so that so that the blood can be sucked up so that pressure that negative pressure uh, starts to build up in the positive one because of uh, uh, because of uh, tension pneumothorax and the cardiac tamponade uh, what they do is uh, that negative uh, thoracic pressure um, starts to uh, increase so in that case of course what will happen your uh, blood coming up from the veins, your lower limb veins won't be able to uh, come up. So in that case, uh, uh, if since there your preload, your uh, there the, your preload would decrease uh, from the right side, and since the preload would decrease, of course, uh, afterload uh, would decrease. Uh, uh, your uh, cardiac output, sorry, your stroke volume would decrease. Yeah, since your preload uh, with uh, if it is decreased, yeah. So that will cause your decreased uh, uh, blood going going to your brain, and ultimately you will collapse. Yeah. So very important 
so same thing your cardiac tamponade it would also cause the same thing because uh, um, preload would decrease then your uh, stroke volume and your cardiac output would decrease and uh, so this is how you uh, recognize circulation problems also so you recognize them by if the person has a syncope or the person has a person is uh, having a acute coronary syndrome so it would uh, complain of some heart attack uh, some heart pain yeah uh, cardiac pain uh, radiating to your left side or does not depends yeah if the patient is diabetic he might not complain of uh, cardiac pain but uh, or simply by looking by ecg if there are, uh, if there are any supra st elevation st depression or uh, uh, um, any um, t problems yeah t waves problems so uh, you can recognize them so or uh, the patient had a syncope in the past like few days back so some so these are the few uh, causes that can uh, or uh, suppose the patient has uh, your uh, uh, urinary catheter foley catheter placed so your cardio suppose uh, then urinary output is suppose less than 0 0.5 yeah so you can um, keep it in a category of uh, oliguria yeah so of course you can have uh, you can imagine since the person doesn't have uh, urine output so there's some circulation problem either the patient might be hypovolemic or uh, the cardiac output is decreased yeah so these are you know, the causes and can be which can be recognized treating them treating them is like suppose the person is hypovolemic we can give uh, crystallized solu uh, solutions again uh, 0 0.9 percent it would be our first uh, it can be our first step we can of course we will measure the blood pressure and everything <clears throat> so and uh, suppose the person is suppose uh, has a acute coronary syndrome then we can and uh, suppose whether it is ST elevation or not or uh, depending on uh, uh, what the circumstances is suppose overall if the person has acs acute coronary syndrome then of course uh, our treatment uh, would be by giving the person uh, aspirin giving the person morphine giving the person oxygen yeah and nitroglycerin uh, so mon mon is the mnemonic yeah uh, mon m for morphine o for your oxygen and uh, a for your aspirin and n for your uh, nitro nitroglycerin so these are the few basic treatment what one must be familiar with so i talked about a air area obstruction is causes of it how to recognize it how to treat it same thing for breathing problems how to uh, what are the causes of it how to recognize it how to treat it and same thing for circulation problem causes recognition and treatment now we'll talk individually about each one of them now, as I already talked about airway, airway. Now, our basic approach would be look for airway obstruction. Looking for airway obstruction is uh, whether it is partial, whether it is uh, uh, whether it is partial, whether it is complete. How do we treat it? We treat it by simple uh, simple um, measures would be um, opening the uh, opening uh, um, the head tilt, opening the areas by simply just by head tilt chin lift maneuvers yeah and giving oxygen yeah or we can use any airways agents also yeah if available and uh, as i talked about suppose the patient has tension pneumothorax we will place uh, we will do needle needle thoracal synthesis by placing simply a needle in second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line then later on uh, once we do the initial decompression we would uh, Put a chest drain yeah so a uh, uh, few maneuvers which we will talk about later also head tilt and everything now breathing problem simply is uh, look listen and feel sorry it's look listen and feel yeah breathing we will look for uh, if the sound is uh, uh, if the patient uh, thorax is uh, expanding in the same way uh, bilaterally because and by if the patient has a chainsaw movement chainsaw movement is uh, simply by because when we do is uh, when we uh, inspire the air our chest expand yeah our chest expand and the abdomen also goes out and below because diaphragm diaphragm goes down and uh, you you can inhale a lot of air inside so both of the movement is uh, of your 
chest and of your abdomen are towards outside. Whereas in the paradoxical breathing, what will happen is uh, your chest will be drawn inside, inwards. Yeah, You can try to do it also because when you uh, uh, inhale, your chest and abdomen both goes outside. But suppose in a breathing problem, um, suppose someone has an intercostal uh, recession yeah so in that case your intercostal muscles uh, what they would do is they would uh, they would uh, work too hard and they will draw your chest inside which is opposite to the normal breathing yeah so in paradoxical breathing or in the chase on chainsaw breathing sorry not chainsaw seesaw breathing your chest would be um, drawn inside inwards so you can easily recognize that like person is having some airway obstruction that's why the person is having this recession intercostal recession or this uh, seesaw breathing or the paradoxical breathing yeah then feel for the feel you, uh, you can listen and feel listen like uh, if the uh, noise is uh, if uh, the air coming out of the mouth or the nose is is it noisy yeah if it is noisy as i already mentioned it is a partial airway obstruction yeah so and of course you can feel for uh, breath um, is it present is it not present yeah then count for respiratory rate because uh, respiratory rate whether it is too uh, uh, high whether it is too high because respiratory drive that means is too high so you can count for the respiratory rate whether it is uh, the basic one is between 12 to 16 yeah so you need you need to count for respiratory rate then because uh, suppose respiratory rate is uh, too high then you can imagine maybe the person has uh, uh, increased co2 uh, accumulation in the body so that's why he is he, he or she is hyperventilating so that to expirate so so that he can um, get rid of that co2 accumulation in the body so that's why uh, his or hers uh, respiratory rate might be high. Then you can access for the depth and the chest expansion. Yeah, uh, you need to see if the chest expansion is uh, bilaterally. Yeah, because suppose in the <clears throat> uh, there could be any uh, uh, chest expansion if they uh, suppose uh, uh, in a pneumothorax or something. Yeah, chest might not be expanding the way it is supposed to be, and uh, all the depths uh, is it again the seesaw if the patient if the person has the seesaw uh, breathing yeah as i already mentioned paradoxical breathing because uh, that is a sign of your uh, intercostal recession or your uh, upper airway obstruction yeah then you can look for any chest deformity or look for jvp because uh, looking for jvp uh, jvp uh, your jugular venous pressure uh, would be increased yeah and uh, your uh, uh, jugular vein, uh, jugular uh, vein, uh, vein uh, would be accentuated. It would be uh, easily visible. Yeah, uh, like uh, uh, suppose the person has uh, cardiac tamponade or the person has uh, tension pneumothorax. So all these uh, or the uh, CO, COPD in uh, suppose it is exacerb ex exacerbated. Um, so in those cases, what uh, that can lead ultimately to your jugular venous pressure increase because your right atrium, right ventricle are um, not able to uh, perform the way are supposed to be, um, and therefore, therefore, uh, uh, blood gets back, blood gets uh, pumped back into your neck. It's not able to enter your right atrium. So uh, anything that causes uh, blood. Uh, not able to uh, accumulate, not able to enter your right ventricle or your right atrium. That will ultimately cause your uh, congestion of blood in your neck. So therefore causing your JVP. Yeah, jugular venous pressure increased or uh, they would be easily visible. Then look for uh, oxygen uh, concentration and saturation. Uh, suppose you are giving someone 100% oxygen and still the patient's or the person's uh, oxygen is somewhere around uh, 70, 80. So that means uh, some shunt is going on, Some there is some problem in the um, lungs. Then listen, breath sounds at patient's face, yeah? Uh, because um, uh, whether uh, the breath sound, breath sound is noisy or is it, you know, uh, as I already mentioned, whether it is, uh, whether it is noisy or not, yeah? 
then you can percuss and auscultate the chest. By percussing, we can imagine, suppose uh, the person has the hyper resonance. Yeah? Hyper resonance would indicate uh, there's an air in the air accumulation, too much air in the lungs, so in the chest. So that will uh, indicate a, a hyper resonance, hyper resonance would indicate a pneumothorax. Yeah? Then uh, suppose uh, there's a dullness, then dullness can uh, uh, make you think about uh, any, uh, suppose uh, there's a plural plural effusion, yeah? So in that case, it, there would be some dullness or some consol consolidation if it's present. Then you can auscultate the chest. Suppose auscultating the chest would help you. Suppose uh, if the your... Uh, your breaths, uh, if you, if there if there are no breath sounds, yeah, you can't listen to any breath sounds. So that could that could again um, make you think about uh, tension pneumothorax or pneumothorax, yeah. So or um, it could be your pleural effusion too, yeah, because uh, it could there in the pleural effusion your chest breath, breath sound could be diminished or absent, yeah. Same thing in the pneumothorax also. They could be diminished or it could be. Uh, Mm, totally absent depending depends on the um, how much severity uh, of those pathology are yeah then checking for the trachea position because uh, now it should be in the midline and uh, suppose uh, the trachea is not in the midline and there it's deviating to the contralateral side suppose the patient has a tension pneumothorax on the right side and you can see the trachea moving towards the left side. So there's a, a contralateral deviation of the trachea, or we can see the uh, mediastinum shift. Yeah, so mediastinum, a uh, whole mediastinum is shifted to the contralateral side, therefore causing a trachea move to uh, on the contralateral side. Therefore, you can think about uh, a severe uh, massive pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax. Then feel chest wall to detect uh, crepitus. Uh, crepitus, you can be uh, thinking about surgical uh, some uh, sub uh, um, emphysema. Yeah, you can think about surgical uh, uh, emphysema or crepitus. These are the sounds which can be palpated uh, because of the air uh, in the subcutaneous layer uh, of the chest. Yeah, um, is, these are the sounds like uh, if someone is walking on the snow. Yeah? So these are the crepitus or the surgical emphysema that can cause your uh, these sounds so that can indica indicate uh, again a uh, pneumothorax yeah so you can think about if the patient has a history of trauma history or even if the person is a um, male patient is smoker yeah tall tall male smoker so you can think about a pneumothorax if you can listen to the crepitus so that's why it's important to feel for the chest now going for the circulation now for the circulation part what we need to do is we need to uh, look for the hand color if uh, uh, either they are pink either they are um, blue yeah or they are mottled so that can help you uh, think about uh, how the perfusion yeah peripheral perfusion of the patient is so very important by looking it then you can access the limb temperature how much is the temperature because uh, in a shock suppose the patient is in a shock then of course uh, they would have uh, cool clammy extremities yeah then you can uh, capillary refill time now capillary refill time usually should be uh, less than two but uh, suppose uh, uh, it is more than two um, then that can indicate again poor peripheral perfusion yeah uh, basically what uh, what you can do is you can uh, take a finger and at the chest level in the on the chest you can press it for five seconds now five seconds yeah uh, you can press on chest with the, your index finger and after five seconds just remove it your finger so that area um, which was you know uh, that area that you know, where you compressed if it uh, gets red on its own within two seconds then its CRT is normal if it doesn't get uh, again uh, reperfuse that area uh, if it doesn't get red again at that particular time less than two seconds then we can say CRT is increased yeah so that's an indication very important indication for shock or uh, poor, perf poor poor peripheral perfusion yeah <clears throat> then uh, we can uh, access the status of, uh, status of the veins uh, we can see if the veins are collapsed now veins would be collapsed or uh, uh, won't be uh, won't be able to uh, 
easily uh, won't, uh, we won't be able to easily palpate them and, or they would be collapsed. So suppose the patient is in a shock or the patient is dehydrated. Yeah. So that will help you uh, give an idea about the circulation problems. Then again, we can think about the pulse rate or the heart rate. Heart rate, whether it's too increased or whether it's because heart rate would be increased. Suppose the patient is in a shock shock state or it is hypovolemic or dehydrated so for the compensation purposes to increase the cardiac output our heart rate would automatically uh, increase yeah so this is how we can get an idea because even the pulse rate suppose and the pulse rate we can uh, say uh, in a, in your uh, cardiogenic shock or in our hypovolemic shock, the difference between your systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure, yeah, it should be somewhere around 35 to 45. But your pulse pressure would be increased, yeah, in uh, cardiogenic shock and your hypovolemic shock. And uh, whereas uh, and um, heart rate, of course, that they they would be increased, yeah. And as an, and uh, then let's talk about the pul palpating your peripheral and central pulses. Uh, we must palpate them because uh, whether they are palpated, we can palpate them. Are they good? Are they synchro synchron with your uh, heartbeats? So are they absent? If they are absent, then we can imagine person in his, person in his car person is in cardiopulmonary arrest. Yeah. Then we can uh, measure the blood pressure. Uh, for an example, suppose the diastolic blood pressure is uh, low that can indicate to the person as a uh, vasodilation, uh, vasodilation yeah uh, sorry going on and uh, that could be in suppose in the uh, suppose in an anaphylactic shock or the septic shock yeah then we could uh, auscultate auscultate uh, the heart uh, we could listen for a few murmurs if they are present if they are present murmurs then we can imagine um, there's some stenosis or uh, regurgitation uh, might be present in the heart so that can create circulation problem too because suppose mitral stenosis there is present so of course there would be uh, low cardiac output and all those things would happen so it could be either of the uh, either of the four wells yeah uh, so it could be either regurgitation or it could be stenosis yeah then looking for other signs of poor cardiac output. Uh, poor cardiac output signs would be like, uh, suppose, uh, how um, <clears throat> other than looking at the um, skin and checking for the blood pressure, checking for the heart rate, what we can do is we can think about uh, urinary output. So if uh, the whether the person is anoric uh, or liguric, so in those cases, of course, we know uh, the person is again in a shock, shocky state or uh, um, not producing uh, not producing any enough urine so that means uh, kidneys are not perfused uh, uh, enough or uh, it is a prenatal problem or it could be post renal problem most probably it would be uh, poor cardiac output it could be any of it could be pre renal post renal so we can imagine uh, the person has hypovolemia yeah then we can look for it uh, we can look for external hemorrhages if we can see any obvious uh, external bleeding going on then uh, of course then we know there's a problem with the circulation and then we need to treat it as accordingly now going for the disability part the d part uh, we need to uh, again review our and treat the abcs yeah each time we do any treatment we need to access reaccess reaccess each and every step we suppose we treat circular breathing then again we need to go towards the A and this is how we need to again start from the very beginning after treating one thing so that it is very important so that we don't miss anything now again before going to the disability part we will treat and reassess uh, ABCs then we go for and check for the patients any drug history yeah if uh, the person might be taking any opioids so he might be having uh, overdose yeah in any benzodiazepine or any barbar barbiturates or uh, whatever might be the case uh, drug history is very important because uh, or any because a person might have taken too many sedatives yeah that can cause a decreased level of consciousness so very important drug history then we will go for and check for the pupil size equality and reaction now why pupil size suppose uh, we go and uh, we look for uh, and we see the person as uh, meiosis yeah uh, pinpoint pupil 
so in those cases we can think about oh this person might be on uh, opioid overdose yeah so because uh, opioid basically cause your pinpoint pupils yeah and then we go for uh, rapid assessment of the consciousness here we can use your uh, APV, apvu uh, score or uh, glasgow coma score yeah so maybe in another topic i'll talk about uh, glasgow coma scale also so a would be your alert the person is alert p is for your uh, uh, if the person um, uh, sorry v v is for your if the person is responding to verbal commands yeah and and uh, if and uh, yeah and uh, if you it would be suppose the person is unresponsive yeah then glasgow coma score score would be your um, for your uh, verbal for your uh, eyes opening or for your eyes and for your motor responses yeah then checking for the blood glucose blood glucose level is very important because uh, a hypoglycemic state can very easily very commonly leads to a uh, depressed level of consciousness and it can be very much uh, mistaken for uh, many of us to think if the person why uh, what could be the reason a person might have some pathology going on or something severe so um, <clears throat> plenty of time uh, blood uh, there the person person might have taken too much insulin yeah person might be diabetic he might take um, he might have taken too much too many too much of insulin or uh, person uh, suppose the person haven't hasn't eaten hasn't ate for uh, a long period of time so his blood glucose might be low so first measure very quickly we must measure the blood glucose and suppose if it is low we must administrate some glucose to the patient and very very rapidly very very rapidly the person will recover then suppose the person is unconscious but has a pulse everything yeah so in that case uh, we would place the person uh, laterally uh, in the recovery position until unless uh, the, uh, we are suspecting any cervical trauma yeah now e part exposure part exposure part would be would we will remove all the all the clothes of the person and we will thoroughly examine examine expose the patient and thoroughly examine each and every uh, part of the body because uh, there could be any penetrating trauma on the back which we haven't discovered till now yeah so these are the few basic things now uh, in hospital what we are supposed to how do we proceed in the for the als uh, first of all our basic fundamental basic uh, initial step would be your personal safety yeah? always uh, ensure our personal safety because until and unless we are safe we want uh, we will uh, we won't be able to uh, uh, protect the person who is uh, affected and uh, uh, once we are also indulged in that same problem suppose there is some uh, short circuit there is current so if we don't assure our safety then we can uh, create problems yeah so uh, we need to ensure our personal safety and suppose in hospital uh, we need to wear gloves yeah then suppose uh, there's a, a uh, we are in the hospital with the tuberculosis so in that case we must wear, uh, wear the mask so these are the few basic things yeah uh, we must think about uh, all the if there are any corrosive uh, substance so we, uh, we must not approach the we are supposed to be so these are the few things then we check for the patient response we shake the how do we check for the patient response we uh, shake the patient we shake the we call for uh, call his name is her name then we shake the patient and uh, this is how we check for response yeah how are you hello sir so we call for them we call for uh, their name yeah then uh, what can happen if the person responds the person says yes i'm fine thank you so that means the person was uh, not uh, the person was a uh, person was uh, wasn't unconscious the person responded so he might be just taking a nap yeah so he responded and since the person talks that means his airway uh, are patent we don't need to do nothing in that case if the patient doesn't respond yeah if the patient doesn't respond what we do 
the person that means the person is unconscious yeah the person is unconscious then we need to call for help asap yeah we need to call for help then the person is unconscious yeah he is not responding then we check for pulse if the person's pulse is present that means it is all okay there's no problem yeah everything is okay we need to call for help for to monitor the patient monitor the person yeah to further investigate what the problem is but person is on the safe side because he or she has a pulse if the person doesn't have a pulse what we need to do we need to check for carotid pulse yeah so we check for the carotid pulse the person has pulse that means a person doesn't have pulse so person doesn't have pulse that means it's a cpa yeah cardiopulmonary arrest going on we need to immediately call for help and start giving compression yeah simple basic life support we need to start doing compression by the time als uh, uh, als arrives als help arrives what our basic purpose is give them 30 compression then two respiration yeah 30 to 2 30 to 2 yeah we and uh, it is in the hospital yeah and uh, for the respiration part what we can do is uh, we can use uh, airway agent airway agents like oro oro pharyngeal or airway or nasopharyngeal airway yeah which i will show in the further slides upcoming slides so those uh, agents could be easily uh, put in the mouth and uh, that can help uh, give some space so that the uh, tongue doesn't fall back because as i already mentioned in the unconscious patient the uh, tongue tongue is the main main culprit which will fall backwards and uh, uh, occlude your airway yeah it will obstruct our airway so we can use those adjuncts so and we do cpr yeah we start cpr 30 to 2 then if the patient is breathing but has pulse what is this patient is breathing but a uh, patient is not breathing but has pulse so that means there's a respiratory arrest going on yeah but now respiratory arrest will ultimately would call would cause cardiopulmonary arrest a complete cpa so in that case what we can do is we can give some uh, breath yeah we can give uh, breath to the patient and every 10 uh, 10 seconds afterwards we will check for any uh, pulse yeah so we keep on checking them by the time help comes yeah uh, then we can give oxygen and we can think about what the problem is so basically respiratory arrest if uh, uh, respiratory arrest would uh, uh, can um, ultimately would, would cause your cardiac arrest too yeah so what uh, if uh, not breathing but has a pulse we can uh, the, uh, we can um, Put him uh, put the person in the recovery position too now if the patient has a uh, patient has a monitor if the patient has a monitor and you see a cardiac arrest yeah so we can go for the als algorithm whether it is a shockable rhythm or whether it is an unshockable rhythm yeah so accordingly we will work on now let's talk about what is als algorithm what is shockable rhythm what is non-shockable rhythm uh, we need to think about only four rhythms yeah now this is algorithm uh, advanced life support algorithm let's very quickly go through it you see there's a person who is unresponsive you call for her you call for his name uh, hello hello sir how are you he doesn't respond not breathing you don't uh, feel any pulse yeah you go for pulse you don't feel any pulse you call for help you do CPR, 30 compression to ventilation, yeah, either by mouth or ma mouth to mask, depends. So, but after giving 30 compression, you stop, give two ventilation, continue 30 compression, yeah. So, this keeps on going on until and unless you, you have an AED, automated uh, external defibrillator, or you have the defibrillator if you are in the hospital. So by the time you attach all the all the pads, yeah, so that uh, or the cardiac monitor which can read whether it is a shockable rhythm or whether it's an unshockable rhythm. Once the help comes, you put on the cardiac pads, cardiac monitor, and defibrillator, and you see over there you you will access the assess the rhythm. 
whether it is a shockable rhythm or whether it is a non shockable rhythm let's talk about if it is a shockable rhythm shockable rhythm we need to think about either it is ventricular fibrillation or it is ventricular tachycardia but without pulse yeah so these two are considered as same considered as same because uh, pulse uh, ventricular tachycardia without pulse is same as ventricular fibrillation because ultimately that will cause vfib also ventricular fibrillation so as soon as you see these two of uh, rhythms on the cardiac monitor you you immediately as soon as possible uh, you will give a shock yeah uh, you will give 200 joules on a biphasic you will give 200 joules shock yeah and after giving the shock again you will start compression yeah without looking at the rhythm no need to look at the rhythm because uh, even if there was a rhythm it won't uh, it won't be sufficient to give uh, uh, circulation to the whole body so that's why our aim is to keep on giving a chest compression then after giving a, a shock 200 joules shock you again after uh, after you give 200 joules shock you do cpr for 2 minutes yeah then again after 2 minutes you access the rhythm suppose again you see ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia again you give a shock then continue cpr then again after 2 minutes you reassess the rhythm now this time if you see uh, again you assess the rhythm and again it if, if it is a shockable rhythm if it is ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia you give again a shock and continue cpr now at this time you can give amiodarone yeah 300 mg or and also you can give adrenaline yeah adrenaline now there's a small controversy over here uh, adrenaline uh, adrenaline can be given even after the second shock after you give first shock uh, up here then again if it was ventricular tachycardia or pulseless ventricular tachycardia then after the second shock you can give adrenaline yeah or after the third uh, third shock you can give adrenaline adrenaline 1 mg yeah 1 to 1000 and plus you can give amiodarone 300 mg also yeah diluted in the glucose yeah so this is for the shockable rhythm then it's while you assess the rhythm in uh, and you see you see a pulseless electrical activity or the asystole yeah so in that case these are the non shockable rhythms in that case only drug which we would which we would use uh, is your adrenaline adrenaline 1 mg 1 to 1000 yeah that is 1 ml yeah 1 ml and you give you see rhythm it's asystole or pulseless electrical activity you give adrenaline and also continue cpr just uh, just compression yeah for 2 minutes and in that case after uh, stopping for 2 minutes after you did your cpr for 2 minutes yeah then you reassess the rhythm again now again if it is a asystole or a pulseless electrical activity in that case again you continue your cpr for another 2 minutes now you access rhythm and now this time you get shockable rhythm you see ventricular fibrillation then you give shock asap yeah and continue compression so this is how it works yeah and while uh going for, while doing all this uh, whether it is shockable whether it is non shockable we need to do the abcd approach abcd approach would be because simultaneously what we will what we need to is if it is a bls basic life support what will what we can do is uh, we could head tilt chin lift maneuvers yeah for the as for breeze we of course we are giving uh, mouth to mouth respiration let's say yeah circulation of course we are doing compression yeah for the uh, cardiopulmonary rest basically we do cab yeah chest compression uh, it comes then your airways then your breathing yeah so and while treating all this we need to think about reversible causes which we will talk about later reversible causes could be your hypoxia yeah one could, that could cause your uh, pulseless electrical activity for let's say yeah then it could be hypovolemia which can again cause your pulseless electrical activity or your asystole 
then it could be hyper hyper hyperkalemia that could again cause your uh, uh, any 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 of these rhythms yeah and then hypothermia again that could cause your pulsars electrical activity then we have thrombosis tamponade toxin and tension pneumothorax yeah we have four t's four and 4H, yeah, or we can say 5Ts or 5H, we will discuss later, which can cause your, suppose your, there is hyperkalemia, that could easily cause your uh, uh, ventricular fibrillation, yeah, so these are, or tension pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax can cause your pulseless electrical activity, your acetally also, your wave, wave, V-fib also, yeah. So these are the basic ELS algorithm. Now, here we can see, shockable rhythm when we need to give 200 joules and start cpr first we give 200 joules then we start cpr yeah and of course before giving the joules also those 200 joules we will start cpr yeah because we want a wait for the the shock to be administered administered because uh, we need to start the chest compression chest compression shouldn't be interrupted yeah they should be continuous so Pulseless electroventricular tachycardia, you can see complex, we can see QRS over here, you know, they are broad, they are broad QRS and they are uh, regular. So this is, and we check for the pulse, the person doesn't have pulse, so that's why this is ventricular tachycardia without pulse, pulseless. Here we can see ventricular fibrillation, a chaotic rhythm with uh, no morphology. So this is ventricular fibrillation. So in both of these, we can uh, we will give shock. Very, very important. ASAP, 200 joules biphasic and 360 joules monophasic. But most of uh, in the hospitals, uh, monophasic are not available anymore. Now, here we can see we have uh, pulseless electrical activity. Now, why pulseless electrical activity? Because it looks like a rhythm, sinus rhythm. We have the P, we have the QRS, we have the T. But when we palpate for uh, central pulse, that is carotid pulse, we won't feel any pulse. So it it's a dissociation, uh, elect, uh, electrical and mechanical dissociation going on. So uh, there's a there's some electrical activity going on, but that is not sufficient to make the heart contract sufficient to uh person to have a patient to have a pulse yeah that's not sufficient that uh, contraction is not sufficient yeah that uh, even if uh, there's some electrical uh, uh, thing going on yeah uh, so that's why it is a pulseless electrical activity now pulseless electric electrical activity it could be uh, one can have one uh, there might be some electrical activity or there might be some mechanical activity yeah so i won't go into too detail of pulseless electrical uh, electrical activity because uh, in one uh, there's some mechan mechanical uh, mechanical activity and in one there is an electrical activity uh, electrical activity going on but ultimately the uh, whatever might be the case uh, that will cause your uh, uh, pulseless electrical activity which would ultimately won't have any uh, mechanical activity as well yeah so that would be the severe case yeah so it's important for the treatment purposes but uh, uh, for the als or for the hospital purposes whenever you see pulseless electrical activity simply just take it consider it as a, a non-shockable rhythm yeah so every time you see a rhythm palpated you don't see a you don't feel a pulse yeah, carotid central pulse, you don't feel it, consider it as a non-shockable rhythm and therefore give adrenaline 1 milligram, 1 to 1000 IV, yeah, direct. Um, and then you can, of course, you can uh, take 10 milliliter of uh, NACL, yeah, saline uh, and infuse it. So that, uh, because uh, since uh, there's no circulation, so that uh, NACL would help to reach it much more fast to the heart. And here we can see a straight line. Everyone knows it. Asystole, bad, very bad. So again, one milligram, one to one thousand solution, and uh, giving it IV directly. Yeah, one one ml of one milligram. One uh, one ml has one milligram. So 
Now, while doing the CPR, we need to think about 5H and 5Ts, hypovolemia, of course, how to treat them. While we are doing CPR, uh, uh, we are treating it simply by giving some fluids here yeah, at that moment or looking for any bleeding or something. Hypoxia, uh, hypoxia can be a major cause and the most common one it could be. And so we are administrating, we are giving high flow oxygen, yeah, 15 liter per minute. Then too many, if the person is in the metabolic, metabolic acidosis, metabolic acidosis, too much hydrogen, we can administrate uh, bicarbonate, yeah, in that case, SCO3. Then we, uh, we must think about uh, hypo or hyperkalemia, yeah, so we can have, uh, um, if uh, ions level are available, then we can think about it. If it is hyperkalemia, then we need to treat it by using uh, a cell butamol nebulizer or uh, insulin with glucose, yeah, and for stabilization, we must use uh, calcium gluconate or calcium chloride solution, yeah. Are, uh, these are the few. Uh, this and these are the main things we need to imagine. What could be the cause causing this problem? Yeah. So we need to think about five H and five Ts. Then hypothermia. It could be easily suppose uh, the person is uh, homeless somewhere outside uh, in the winters. So his blood pressure. Uh, sorry, his blood temperature. His uh, body temperature is too low. So we can imagine the cause of his uh, this. Cardiopulmonary arrest is hypothermia. So in that case, we need to uh, we need to uh, correct his um, body temperature and uh, we need to continue CPR for very very long time. It could be even five hours, six hours, ten hours depends because uh, we need to correct. We need to bring body temperature, yeah, somewhere to a good amount, somewhere somewhere near to 32, 35 depends yeah so that uh, we can consider the uh, patient is unsalvageable yeah uh, we can um, declare death only if body temperature is corrected then we think about uh, toxins we think about all the drug overdose yeah suppose there's a opioid over overdose whatever then we can give naloxone yeah then suppose if we think about tension pneumothorax, then as already mentioned, we need to uh, put a needle, um, 14 gauge needle or any uh, 14 or uh, 16 gauge needle in the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, just to immediately do a needle thoracosynthesis that is in the second intercostal space to decompress ASAP as soon as possible to decompress. Then later on we can put, after decompressing once, we can put uh, um, your chest drain. Then again, think about cardiac tamponade. Can cardiac tamponade again? We can do uh, uh, pericardiosynthesis, neural pericardiosynthesis. Uh, in that case, uh, for the immediate effect, and later on, a uh, thoracotomy might be done to save save the patient. Then thinking about the thrombosis. Thrombosis can be your uh, causing a pulmonary embolism or even it could be your myocardial infarct that has led to your respiratory, cardiorespiratory arrest. Yeah. So pulmonary embolism and all that we need to treat accordingly simply by giving thrombolytics. Yeah. Then airway management and ventilation. Now causes of airway obstruction, as I already mentioned, that could be, uh, as uh, we have already discussed, uh, it could be partial and uh, complete and anything that depresses your level of consciousness can cause your airway obstruction. Then uh, how to recognize the airway obstruction? Airway obstruction uh, would be recognized by uh, simple, uh, uh, by looking, listening and feeling. Yeah, look, listen and feel. We need to look for them, we need to listen, we need to feel, which I have already talked about. Then choking, again I have talked about choking. Now, choking could be uh, uh, create mild or severe symptoms. Now, suppose if the if the sign if the sign if the sign and symptoms are mild of the choking, uh, person starts to choke. Then let him choke if the uh, because uh, uh, it might help so that because if the person has a cuff, that cuff would itself uh, help to deobstruct that uh, 
obstruction suppose he had a, a food that is uh, that has obstructed his airway so if he's choking he might and he has a cough he she has a cough then let him cough because cough might help but if he or she doesn't have a cough then and uh, sinus symptoms are severe or even if he has a cough but sinus symptoms are too severe then immediately what we could do is we could give five back blows here like this all right or and later on then we can give five abdominal thrust yeah this one is the heimlich maneuver yeah and uh, give, by giving back blows and by uh, abdominal thrust what will happen is uh, the pressure over here yeah would increase the pressure over in the thorax uh, thorax would increase yeah it would be it would uh, uh, increase very much and that will of course uh, um, push your food food or any uh, foreign object uh, outside your mouth so this is the main thing this one is the heimlich so this one these are the few steps for the choking now how do we open the airway airway can be opened by three maneuvers yeah head tilt chin lift chin lift and jaw thrust now jaw thrust is the one which is very important this one uh, if the person if, if the person had any accident or if, if the person had any fall had any fall or uh, or in any case if we are suspecting uh, any spinal cord injury or a spinal injury a spinal cervical injury yeah so in that case uh, we won't do a head tilt we won't chin lift we simply will do jaw thrust simply by placing all our fingers here uh, fingers at the uh, over here at the angle and at the border of the mandible and simply by uh, and with the our thumb area we will depress our chin and simply by opening your mouth and pulling from pulling your angle of mandible over here whereas if you are not suspecting any spinal cord injury cervical spinal cord injury yeah so in that case we will uh, assume the person doesn't have any spinal cord injury so therefore we can uh, head tilt the patient over here head tilt and chin lift because uh, here we can see the tongue is getting back if the obstruction of the tongue uh, is uh, uh, obstructing your uh, glottic area so now what we will do is we will head tilt and chin lift so in that case this will somehow pull the tongue forward this will pull the tongue forward and therefore de obstructing our trachea and the, this area all right so these are the uh, this is our basic technique what what we would do until and unless we have uh, uh, how to intubate and we don't have any uh, we don't have laryngoscope or nothing so these are the simple maneuvers which we must be able to use now definition about the failed intubation uh, now this one is for the uh, this one is for the intubating purposes now failed intubation would be when we won't be able to place any endotracheal tube that will be called as failed intubation then failed airway would be a situation when we won't be able to intubate and we won't be able to ventilate also and difficult intubation would be when it requires more than three attempts yeah we'll discuss each one of them now this one is the main uh, main airway algorithm very let's very quickly go through it person let's say needs an needs an intubation the person is unresponsive we will consider it as a crash airway yeah so in this case we don't need to do no rsi no rapid sequence uh, rapid sequence intubation no need we simply just consider it as a crash airway and we intubate the patient we might use succinyl choline or uh, rocornium um, not even rocornium succinyl choline will be good because it has a very fast mechanism of action so in that case uh, we will consider it uh, it is as a crash airway suppose a situation like this would be someone has a cardiac arrest yeah uh, cpa cardiopulmonary arrest so no need of drugs in this case so in this case we won't need no drugs we simply just intubate the patient either by uh, using uh, uh, an endotracheal tube by laryngoscope or simply by placing any uh, 
supraglottic airway yeah somehow we need to manage so cpa cardiopulmonary arrest patient would be considered as crash airway and suppose the patient doesn't have cpa cardiopulmonary arrest and uh, person is uh, suppose not uh, unresponsive he's responsive he she is responsive then of course then we have time then we need to uh, assume we need to um, uh, assume that whether the person uh, we would be able to intubate the patient easily or we won't be able to intubate the person easily or whether the supraglottic airway can be put easily or not yeah but basically we will think about intubation part whether it will be difficult or whether it will it would be easy so if it, it is difficult airway then we will go for the difficult airway algorithm now if there is no difficult airway algorithm then simply what we can go, go for we can go rapid sequence intubation why rapid sequence intubation in this case we are going for uh, and not considering difficult airway because if it is a difficult airway then we will avoid rsi rsi because we use some drugs yeah we use drugs uh, and especially drugs like uh, relaxing yeah muscular uh, relaxant yeah skeletal muscular skeletal mus uh, muscle relaxants like your depolarizing agents and your non depolarizing agents uh, like your succinyl choline or roconium which is most commonly used these two so if if you if you assume and if we suspect this patient has difficulty airway then we won't go for RS, rsi in that case yeah then we need to think about few other things but if you are not expecting any difficulty airway then everything is okay then we can go for R rsi yeah? rapid sequence intubation in rapid sequence intubation of course we will sedate the patient uh with any uh, with um, few of uh, main drugs which we will talk about then we attempt intubation and if the intubation is successful then we go for the post intubation management and if we couldn't intubate that patient then in that case uh, it is and we can't even uh, able to maintain ventilation oxygenation so in that case we will consider it as a failed airway where we will uh, we would uh, later on we need to do cricothyroidotomy yeah so here are the these are the, this one is the main airway algorithm then we have the crash airway algorithm then we have a difficult airway algorithm and we have the failed airway algorithm so let's discuss each one of them now as I already mentioned crash airway uh, crash airway uh, algorithm is the most simplest one because person has a cardiac arrest person had person had collapsed and has a cardiac arrest doesn't have pulse then uh, according to the ALS uh, protocol of course we will um, do chest compression and we will defibrillate we will give adrenaline as already mentioned but what about the crash airway in crash airway we don't need to do nothing simply we uh, give oxygen high flow oxygen 15 liter per minute and we need to intubate yeah here is no here is no scenario whether uh, whether to give drugs whether to uh, sedate the patient or whether so there's no problem so simply we just intubate but even after intubating suppose or if you are not able to intubate and we can't maintain the oxygen yeah we can't ventilate the patient then we will consider it considered it as a failed airway so in that case we will do again cryo cryothyroidotomy and suppose we are not able to maintain the oxygenation and we can't even intubate suppose we can't intubate then what maximum what we can do is we can use some succinyl choline yeah that is two milligram per kilogram so that um, there's no rigidity there's so that the muscle relaxes all the neck muscles everything relaxes so that you can easily intubate and after giving that succinyl choline choline then we can again attempt intubation and if it is successful then again post intubation management again the same thing if we are not able to maintain oxygenation failed airway algorithm now let's talk about the difficult airway uh, algorithm in difficult airway uh, algorithm um, 
we want uh, we need to uh, already appreciate we need to already assume whether this would be a difficult airway or not yeah because in a crash airway here this one we, we don't need to assume nothing because it's a medical emergency it's a emergency which we need to immediately work on so here we don't need we don't have no time no time is available so we need to just work on it asap yeah so no need of drugs and if you really want maximum what you can use is succinyl choline but otherwise just keep on try to intubate or if you can't intubate at all go for failed airway this is crash airway algorithm difficult airway algorithm would talk about suppose you need to intubate a patient and but you assume by looking at these few factors few things few scores uh, you think oh no i won't be able to intubate this patient so in that case that would uh, you will go accordingly according to your difficult airway algorithm how then how do we assume that this person airway would be difficult to uh, secure it would be difficult by if you can imagine if you use a laryngoscope for intubation it would be difficult simply by score of lemon by using your bag, bag mask ventilation bag, bag mask ventilation it would be difficult to give ventilation to the patient to improve his oxygenation it would be difficult simply by mnemonic moans and if your supraglottic airway or your or your extraglottic airways yeah you think it would be difficult it would be difficult to secure then we will go for the rods and if suppose ultimately for the failed airway you are going for the cricothyrotomy uh, then in that case you use mnemonic smart here in this one d1 is suppose you go for lemon and moans then of course no need to go for d only d1 your uh, uh, distortion yeah distortion is the part yeah which is uh, which is different over here rest ro and s would be all included let's talk about it now this is lemon one now lemon one is for your uh, your laryngoscope yeah for intubation that difficult intubation we go for lemon we look externally the person has facial trauma or has a beard or has a mustache or has a any basically trauma is uh, a bleeding outside so bleeding uh, so we can imagine by just by looking externally that laryngo intubation would be difficult then we need to evaluate through the 332 rule yeah here is the distance which i will show then we have a melampathy score if it is more than 3 and obstruction if there's any uh, epiglottitis or there's advic advic uh, um um edema or there's trauma peritonsillar abscess so of course these would co these would cause obstruction the neck we have neck mobility suppose the patient has uh, uh, remote uh, remotitis arthritis so in that case of course we know the neck won't be able to, no, neck won't be that much mobile yeah so it would be evil you won't be able to uh, hyper uh, hyper extend the neck while you intubate so it would be difficult so these are the few mnemonics here yeah, lemon here here is for the 332 rule here it is uh, basically uh, either you ask the patient or you yourself take three fingers and if these three fingers can enter in, in the mouth that means a mouth can be opened uh, sufficiently so your intubation won't uh, uh, there won't be any problem in the intubation yeah then here from the mental and uh, here from the mental and till the, your hyoid you again take three fingers yeah that distance should be covered yeah then again taking uh, two fingers over here uh, from your uh, thyroid cartilage over here uh, till your over your larynx in this area so this is your two fingers uh, should accommodate so this is your 332 rule this is how you evaluate here it is the three fingers again three fingers and here the two fingers yeah all right so here it is written um, three fingers uh, you're in between your uh, incisors teeth above and below then your uh, distance between your hyoid bone and uh, your mental area yeah mental 
so three fingers should be here and two would be your thyroid till your two fingers till your floor of mouth here so this is your thyroid cartilage over here your adam's apple from your adam's apple till your two fingers till your floor of your mouth three three two rule now melampathy score this one over here we can see class one class two class three class four um, in these we can see uh, a complete visualization of uvula hard pellet soft pellet everything is everything is okay same here so uh, if melampathy one melampathy two is present uh, class two these flow there won't be any problems for the uh, laryngoscopy uh, for the intubation in class three and class four uh, then you can assume that uh, there would be some problems while you intubate because uh, here we can see while visualize uh, visualization over here we can see some part of the uvula yeah and uh, here the pillars yeah tonsillar pillars are uh, almost not that much well seen and hard pellets is seen and some part of the soft pellet here we can see soft pellet is not seen at all no soft pellet only the hard pellet seen and no uvula seen and pillars also tonsillar pillars also not seen as, as seen at all so this one definitely would be your a difficult uh, laryngoscopy laryng uh, intubation then moans is for your uh, bag ma bag mask ventilation so before intubating we must assume that this one would be uh, difficult uh, uh, person to be ventilated so why because if he has mass seal moans mass seal yeah because if you want you are not able to seal it properly yeah so that's why it's better two persons if we assume that uh, someone has moans it would be difficult bag mass ventilation so in that case we will ask uh, uh, someone to uh, ventilate uh, with the a bag mask and you should use your two hands here yeah? you're uh, making it c bilaterally c shaped and this is how you seal it properly so then if the person is ob obese yeah person is obese so uh, too much tissue is present and uh, air raid you know uh, can't be secured uh, properly yeah so ventilation would be difficult if the person is age uh, more than 55 years yeah basically 60 or 55 so in that case uh, too much elastic area is here present yeah elastic too much elasticity um, so you won't be able to make a proper seal then if the person doesn't have any teeth yeah so no teeth then again it would be difficult for uh, uh, making a seal with this mask over here and it will be difficult to ventilate then if the person has stiff lungs suppose um, any uh, uh, restrictive problems so resistance suppose like copd if the person has copd so while you ventilate there would be resistance so the air, air flow uh, would be uh, resisted and it would be uh, hard to ventilate so here you can imagine moans for bag mask ventilation beard and beard also yeah it would be a part so that's why we can see here uh, Santa Claus with big beard. Then we have rods. Now rods one is for your supraglottic air replacement or your extraglottic air replacement. Now rods is for your uh, simple mnemonics are for your restricted mouth opening as already discussed. Obstruction as already discussed. If any obstruction would be present, yeah. And stiff lungs or C spine. Stiff lung or C-spine, suppose as already discussed, suppose the patient has ankylosing spondylitis or uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So these uh, problems uh, create your decreased neck flexion. So, but main one in the rods is your distorted airway. Yeah? Suppose uh, uh, any pathology, if there is a lung tumor or something, uh, sorry, um, any tumor in the airway, so, or there's a trauma, so you can imagine this is a distorted tumor. So you won't be able to place any supraglottic airway. Yeah? If there's a facial trauma or if there's a neck trauma or there is a neck edema, whatever the case might be. So these are the cases you won't be able to place your supraglottic airway also. Yeah, here we can see one. Here is the one for the rods. Here we can see uh, uh, eye gel. Um, here we can see eye gel and uh, it is above the level of the 
glottis. So that's why supraglottic airway. Yes, perfect example of this. Here we can uh, see uh, laryngeal, uh, laryngeal airway, uh, most probably a uh, king size, uh, king laryngeal airway over here. And uh, here's a balloon, an inflated balloon. Here we have, for the eye gel, we don't need uh, to inflate this thing over here. And uh, for uh, this one, for uh, laryngeal mask airways, LMAs, we need to inflate. So here we can see a balloon inflated in the esophagus over here. So therefore obstructing it and therefore the air, the air can enter in the uh, your trachea. Now smart mnemonic is for the difficult uh, cricothyroidotomy. Here we can see uh, a needle, cricothyroidotomy. Here we have uh, this membrane, cricothyroid membrane. And here we need to here we have the cricoid cartilage here and here and here we have the thyroid cartilage so we need to insert this below thyroid cartilage that is your adam's apple palpating your adam's apple and below it and above the cricoid cartilage we have a membrane and insert it insert this uh, uh, needle so that it could be done uh, surgically or it could be needle cricothyroidotomy depending on the urgency so this would be our last ultimate resource and basically in the failed airways algorithm again talking about uh, what we could do is uh, we do laryngoscopy we try to intubate we succeeded that is ett is placed all good we are not able to intubate we try to put supraglottic airway device yeah either your eye gel either your combi tube either your laryngeal mask airways anyone so we try to put any one of these we succeeded okay everything is okay treated same as uh, almost like intubate uh, 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 intubating like we can ventilate the patient that is important yeah again we can try to intubate or we can do cricothyroidotomy but suppose if you couldn't put any of these neither eye gel or your uh, laryngeal mask airway or your combi tube then what we do is we try to ventilate the patient yeah with a face mask if we succeed we wake the patient up and we uh, don't do anything further we just uh, cancel that procedure on that particular day but if the patient doesn't wake up and uh, therefore we can't intubate we can't oxygenate our last resource would be cricothyroidotomy. So here again, difficult tracheal intubation encountered in unconscious patient would be primary approach to intubation successful. We need to assume whether supraglottic airways, supraglottic devices, or the face mask. We, we would be able to oxygenate the patient. If yes, we would be able to oxygenate the patient and you we have time then we can uh, again try to intubate we have another two chances to intubate but we can't intubate and we can't oxygenate and we don't have no time for any option we go for cricothyroidotomy yeah or we try to before that we can if we have time we can go for supraglottic uh, device but this is the last resource one once only we can try supraglottic airway here this is the case if we can't oxygenate, can't, uh, can't oxygenate, can't intubate. Here we can say we can't intubate, we can't, we, but we can oxygenate. Yeah. So we again have two attempts for uh, to intubate, and again if we can't intubate, I guess twice. Yeah. Then we go for supraglottic airway when device ventilation, and ultimately if that that fails too, then we go for cricothyroidotomy. Again, same thing representing. Here's a, a difficult airway and difficult intubation algorithm. We attempt intubation. If intubation is, is successful, then we secure the tube and post uh, intubation care. If we try to intubate, it is unsuccessful, then try to adjust the position and everything. Go for another attempt, yeah? But try to bring someone who has experience to intubate, yeah? Then if again, second attempt fail if it's successful then go for post intubation care but if second attempt fails go for eye gel yeah 
or any other supraglottic airway like combi tube or LMA. If that is unsuccessful, try last bag, bag mask ventilation. Yeah, bag mask ventilation attempt, last one. If it goes okay, you can, uh, if you can oxygenate the patient, it's okay, wake him up and leave it. But if it's unsuccessful, then go for surgical airway. That is your definite airway, like your uh, cricothyroidotomy. Yeah. Here is for the here are a few examples for your difficult airway for your laryngoscopy. Difficult as we already mentioned with the mnemonic of your uh, lemon. Yeah. So M M in the lemon is melampathy uh, score over here. Already discussed. You can see class three and class four would be difficult one. Uh, we, you won't be able to intubate it won't be easy so therefore uh, someone with the experience is needed and this one sorry and this one if uh, we see class 4 then of course it is a difficult airway very difficult airway so we need to try to avoid intubating in such patients now here is a failed uh, failed airway now if we have the Um, suppose we have the failed airway. Failed airway criteria is can we oxygenate or can we ox uh, we, we won't be able to oxygenate. If we can oxygenate with the help of extra glottic device, then we must try them. Yeah. And if we uh, if it works, then we go for cricot. If it doesn't work, we go for cricothyroidotomy. If we are not able to oxygenate, we go for uh, we can't maintain the oxygenation. Then we go for Again, extraglottic device, cricothyroidotomy, or any video laryngoscope if available. Yeah, video laryngoscope would definitely help us a lot. Then, with any of these maneuvers, if we are able to place endotracheal tube, if yes, then we go for post intubation management. And if we are not uh, again able to place, even after video laryngoscope and uh, any of these methods tried, if we are not able to place uh, cuffed and it endotracheal tube in the trachea then in that case again our last last resource will be your cricothyroidotomy here are the few adjuncts which we can see which uh, helps a uh, helps lot helps us a lot here we can see oropharyngeal airway and here is the nasal airway yeah? so these are these these can be the part of your bls basic life support here we can see oropharyngeal airway over here and here we can see going through the nose into the mouth this is your nasopharyngeal airway ventilation would be your mouth to mouth it could be mouth to mask or it is bag mask yeah so here we can see the bag mask ventilation yeah mouth to mouth is now uh, not mandatory so chest compression is must so even if ventilation is somehow uh, someone doesn't want to do it then they can avoid it so therefore chest compression is the must but in the hospital we have uh, bag mask available for the ventilation so until a definite airway is uh, present uh, endotracheal tube is present in the trachea uh, we need to do twice uh, two ventilation and 30 compression these are again Alternative airway devices, which I already talked about. Here we can see laryngeal mask airway with a cuff over here so that we can inflate this cuff over here. Sorry, this mask over here, laryngeal mask with this cuff. This is LMA. This is eye gel. Um, here we can, uh, it can be blindly inserted. It can be blindly inserted. All these supraglottic airways are blindly inserted. You don't need any laryngoscope to insert them. And this is placed above the glottis over here. You can see in glottic area above the larynx. So here we can here we can see it. And attaching this with the um, bag mask and therefore ventilating the patient. Then we have laryngeal tube over here and the combi tube. Here we have the King LT over here. Here we have the esophageal tracheal combi tube over here, uh, very commonly used. Uh, then we have the LMA over here again. 
and here is the IGL. So all these are very uh, frequently used. Um, King laryngeal tube is not that much used anymore, uh, but your uh, this one combi tube over here. This one has uh, uh, one cup for your uh, trachea and one for your esophagus over here. So so that in, it can block it and uh, avoid somehow aspiration. Yeah. LMS doesn't uh, protect your airways that much comparatively to your combi tube. And eye gel present over here, very easy to insert. No need to inflate the mask. And here we can see a laryngoscope. And here is the endotracheal tube going in your trachea. Yeah, It should be above your carini, uh, where the di uh, division of your uh, trachea takes place, so it is above that, your uh, tube, um, end part of this ATT should be around few centimeters above over here, we can see, here we can see, and then here is the balloon, here is the balloon which gets inflated, yeah, this is the intubation. Now, last one is, last resource is your cricothyroidotomy. Here we can see the Adam's apple, thyroid cartilage. Here we have the cricoid cartilage. Here's the membrane. Make a vertical incision and open the airway. And this is how you save the patient. Last resource. Then, <clears throat> basic mechanical ventilation. In basic mechanical ventilation, of course, uh, role is to ventilate the patient and, and to provide the oxygen and to ventilate the patient and uh, this simply works by giving uh, positive pressure to the lungs we as we know uh, our body works we uh, we breathe uh, with the help of intra uh, negative intrathoracic pressure yeah so pressure is negative but whereas uh, mechanical ventilation or the positive pressure ventilation they work by giving positive pressure in the lungs over here so after intubating after intubating the patient we need to attach the ett tube with the to the this ventilator over here now peri arrest arrhythm arrhythmias can occur they can either be tachycardias or they can be bradycardias tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias sorry not cardias tachycardias or bradycardias we can simply say but in the context of uh, arrest cardiopulmonary arrest, we better call them tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias. Here's the algorithm. Suppose the patient has a stop and you see, um, for the stop, as I already mentioned, someone has a cardiopulmonary arrest. Um, uh, we want to be able to, uh, we want to go for this algorithm. This one is algorithm for adult tachycardia. This is some, uh, uh, this is, uh, suppose the person is ill, person is sick and uh, hasn't got cardiopulmonary arrest yet but the person is uh, in uh, person has a monitor and you can easily recognize the rhythm suppose and the person has a pulse so in that case what we will do is if the person is unstable yeah person has a tachycardia suppose the heart rate is 150 you go for you go for check for the adverse features whether the person has shock syncope or uh, any um or any um pain in the chest yeah, chest pain or any signs of heart failure that is your dyspnea or congestion yeah or uh, wrong eyes or any uh, heart sound can be heard yeah uh, any sign of uh, accumulation of fluid in the body heart failure or any shock blood pressure is too low or the person has syncope or any depressed level of consciousness and if the person has any four of these any one of these and a person has a tachycardia but has a pulse then we give synchronized shock yeah synchronized shock we press we press on the sync button and we give synchronized shock for tachycardias it would be somewhere around uh, 70 to 120 yeah so then after attempting three shocks if, if still the person is tachycardic and has this adverse features present we can go for amiodarone 3 300 milligram and uh, again we can give shock and again we can go for amiodarone 900 milligram on the infusion yeah for going for one day so this is for the if the person has person is tachycardic person has a tachycardia but has a pulse yeah also but along with that has 
features of these yeah blood pressure is low or the level of consciousness is low um or has a, has a chest pain or has a uh, congestion yeah in the lungs or in the heart yeah signs of heart failure dyspneic dyspnea for an example so we go for synchronized shock in those cases three attempts then go for a amiodarone 300 mg again shock and uh, then we can go for amiodarone again 900 mg but if the person doesn't have any any of these features and has a tachycardia with the pulse then we go for we check for whether the tachycardia that tachyarrhythmia is whether the qrs complexes are broad or if or, or if they are narrow if the qrs complexes are broad then we need to check whether it is regular or irregular if it is irregular then it could be your atrial fibrillation with bbb yeah bundle branch block or it could be your tosade point or it could be your atrial fibrillation yeah important one is if they are broad if they are irregular then think about it afib with the uh, right or left bundle branch block or your polymorphic ventricle tachycardia that is also your torsade point then if it is regular then it is regular then it is it, it is a ventricular tachycardia with a pulse yeah then in this case it is a stable ventricular tachycardia therefore we can give amiodarone yeah 300 milligram over here or we can give or it, it could be supraventricular tachycardia just like your over here this one yeah it could be your proximal supraventricular tachycardia if even if it is regular then if the qrx complex is less than 0 0.12 second or it is uh, less than 120 milliseconds yeah one to less than 120 milliseconds or less than 0 0.12 seconds and if it is that means it is a narrow qrs if that narrow QRS, again, if it's narrow, if it's regular, then it is a uh, PSVT, yeah, proximal supraventricular tachycardia. In that case, we will first go for vagal, vagal maneuvers. Yeah, we will try to do some vas valsalva. Ask the patient to do some valsalva, or um, just by, um, for an example, um, asking the patient to, to exhale, exhale. Um, with the uh, uh, with the mouth closed try to exhale with the mouth closed or we could do some uh, carotid massage yeah uh, carotid massage but um, be aware uh, there shouldn't be any brew present because if there's a brew present then that means uh, it's a sign of uh, carotid stenosis and uh, therefore um, we should avoid that ipsilateral part so therefore in that case if there's a carotid brew present then we need to uh, do a well salva, uh, sorry, carotid massage on the contralateral side. And after, if the vagal maneuvers fail, then we can give adonisin six milligram. It has a very, show, very, very short half life, few seconds. So patient will uh, feel a lot of pain, but luckily just for a few seconds, one, two seconds. So um, very, very good drug, interesting drug. So we will go uh, give six milligram, yeah, IV, uh, followed by. Uh, some 10 ml 20 ml of saline yeah so that uh, that can be pushed very quickly you can raise the hand of the patient so that it can be delivered very fast and then wait and watch if the rhythm is converted or not back to sinus rhythm or not if it is converted then it's all okay get an ecg and everything is okay if it doesn't restore if it doesn't get restored if uh, uh, it doesn't come back normal then consider it uh, 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 as a atrial, flit, atrial flutter then treat it as a atrial flutter yeah by controlling the rate for an example giving beta blocker or and of course you will call the cardiology help too but if your narrow qrs complex the stable narrow qrs complex yeah if it is irregular then in that case this is atrial fibrillation then controlling rate again here with with beta blockers and if there's heart heart failure then we can give digoxin or amiodarone here we can see regular broad so going back here we can see regular and broad so this one ventricular tachycardia or svt with bbb yeah it, here it is so here we can see broad complex qrs broad complex qrs broad, broad complex qrs 
and it is regular at the regular interval. So this is ventricle tachycardia with pulse. So here it is and treatment here according to the algorithm amidurin 300 milligram. Then irregular broad that is more than 0 0.12 second or more than uh, more than 120 milliseconds it is irregular. Here we can see QRS here, QRS here, distance between these QRS and these RS, RR is uh, bigger than comparatively here and these are irregular here also you can see these are irregular and QRS is broad, QRS is broad more than 0 0.12 second or more than 120 millisecond and since it is irregular, irregular and broad it could be your atrial, fibr atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block yeah of course this one is irregular and broad but this is not uh, your toes are the point so here it is irregular and broad atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block in the same thing here here we can see this is the tosad most probably yeah this one is the tosad as we can say as we can see yeah irregular polymorphic qrs and irregular broad polymorphic qrs complex yeah this is your tosad so here we would uh, administrate uh, around 2 mg of uh, magnesium sulfate iv yeah this is tosad most probably yeah then going on to the next side of your regular of your uh, tachyarrhythmias regular narrow now this is regular narrow um, since this is regular and narrow this is most probably your um, PSVT uh, proximal supraventricular tachycardia because as we can see uh, no P waves also here also and if they, this one is your regular this one is your regular the difference between uh, um, proximal supraventricular tachycardia and atrial fibrillation is in both of them you won't be able to see any P waves here we can't see P waves these are T's T waves, T waves, T waves, and QRS, QRS, QRS. Here also, T waves, QRS, T waves, QRS. You won't be able to see P waves. Same like in atrial fibrillation, also you won't be able to see P waves. But the difference is uh, SVT, supraventricular tachycardias, yeah, proximal supraventricular tachycardias. Uh, um, these one are regulars, whereas uh, your atrial fibrillation are irregular. So this, as we can see, regular. All the QRS, RRR, RRR are at a regular interval. So this one is your PSVT. Um, what we do? How do we treat? We do some vagal maneuvers, some valsalvas, and if not restored, regular uh, sinus rhythm is not restored, then we do uh, your adenosine, yeah, six milligram. And if again not restored, then we give twelve milligram of adenosine. Now going on to the regular, this one is narrow and irregular, irregular therefore here we can see the distance QRS, see QRS RR is broad, RR is too long and here is RR distance is too short, this is irregular, yeah, this is more and we can see no, yeah, over here, this one is over here, T, 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 over here, yeah again here we can see irregular yeah see the distance see the distance between between rrr over here 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 this most probably is your and we can't see no p waves this is your atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation yeah again we control the rate by giving beta blockers and uh, if the person has heart failure also then we give uh digoxin yeah and uh, if atrial fibrillation is for uh, less than uh, if, uh, more than two days unknown then we need to anticoagulate the patient too now this one is for the bradycardia again the patient if the patient has four rhythms uh, for uh, adverse features if yes we give atropine 500 uh, Microgram now um, it has changed to mm, recent guidelines says uh, it, it is changed to one milligram. Yeah, so that means 1000 microgram atropine. Atropine shouldn't be given less than 500 milli microgram in any case because then it creates more problems. 
rather than improving. Yeah, and it, uh, it paradoxically uh, decreases the heart rate if given less. Yeah, so less than 500 microgram is in, uh, uh, out of criteria. And now, according to the new guidelines, even 500 microgram is not suitable. Um, it should be started with one milligram. So you give atropine, the patient is with bradycardia. And if you, if you get atropine, if the improves, heart rate improves, then you think of if the patient has a, any sign, any risk of asystole out of these four, yeah. Mobis type 2 block or your type 3 block, yeah. Or person had recent asystole or if the ventricle pauses more than three seconds. If these risks are not available, then observe, yeah. Tell the court cardi our cardiology colleagues and they will observe accordingly. And if the risk of asystole is present, even if after the response was okay, then we go for again these measures. Yeah. Transcutaneous spacing is the most important one, but we can give adrenal also. Yeah. But here we give 2 to 10 microgram per minute. Yeah. And again, we can give atropine 500 microgram if needed. Other, other uh, medications, alternative medications to improve, to increase your heart rate, as we know, you can give aminophilin, yeah, dopamine or glucagon. Glucagon would be if the patient has beta blocker or calcium channel blocker uh, blockers overdose. Yeah. So these are the few alternative includes. Here, if the features of uh, asystole are present, so for example, here we have the first degree AV block. Here we can see PR interval is increased. PR interval. Here is uh, Wenke back, a Mobis type 1, second degree. Here we can see PR is the same, but here uh, P would be dropped. And here again, second uh, degree AV block. Over here, here we have uh, no communication between no QRS. And the P wave and the third degree AV block, there's complete dissociation between P waves and the QRS. Yeah, here we can say QRS on its own, P wave on its own, P wave here again. QRS is uh, conducted by this P wave, but here this one is not conducted, so totally a mismatch. All right, so that was a, a small presentation of for advanced life support. That's all. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you.